So, um, this is a bit of a different topic that I haven't really delved into on here before. But nevertheless, it's one that's been on my mind for a while now, and uh, recent events and announcement have really brought this issue into the forefront of my mind. So, I figured that uh, me making a video about it would be a good fit, and it's a topic that I really wanted to talk about. So, yeah, I thought I'd get onto it. This video is about my thoughts on the current state of backwards compatibility and legacy content as a whole that's available on modern platforms and why I feel that a lot of companies are just missing the point as to why so many people including me want them to do so much more when it comes to legacy content as well as just underlying to me just how important legacy content is nowadays. The catalyst to me discussing this, of course, was the announcement around a week ago that Sony would be shutting down the PlayStation stores on PS3, PSP and PS Vita. It's an announcement that didn't exactly come as a surprise that it had been rumoured for a while beforehand and you could tell more or less the writing was on the wall when Sony announced that you wouldn't be able to buy games from these systems via the web version of the store anymore. But nevertheless, it's a decision that for me just perplexes me when it comes to the idea of companies pushing digital content as the norm nowadays. Look, I totally see why this is the case. A digital only future is just where the world is heading, not just in gaming, but also in all forms of media like music and films. I see the advantages of digital media, I really do, and despite the fact I'm a huge advocate for physical media and still actively buy stuff physically, which you're probably aware of if you've seen my collection videos which I'll pop in the iCard right now, I would be 100% lying if I said that everything being digital and all being in one place and the convenience that it brings with it isn't a damn appealing thing sometimes. But it's decisions from Sony like this that ultimately just remind me why I still buy games physically wherever possible. Jim Ryan, the current head of PlayStation, has come out multiple times in the past few years when asked about backwards compatibility that he just doesn't understand why people nowadays would want to play PS1 and 2 games and that backwards compatibility is a feature that gets requested a ton but just isn't really used by many people. I mean, that's a perfectly valid argument. It is true that not a whole lot of people may use backwards compatibility, but I just can't help but feel that Ryan is missing the point or just not considering an alternative angle as to why so many people want legacy content to be readily available on modern PlayStation consoles. It's not always about necessarily playing them all the time over the newer titles to me. It's about preserving old video games as we know it, so potentially great titles from before the digital age are not essentially lost to the sands of time forever. Look, I get it. Most of what the PS3 store offers that's digital only were also released on other systems like the 360 PC or even some Nintendo systems, and in the case of DLC, many PS3 games did get given definitive or Game of the Year editions that contain all the relevant DLC on disc, so it's not like everything is going away. But what about all the games and DLC that's not been re-released and probably never will? There are multiple PS3 games that are digital only that have never been ported to other consoles, such as Infamous Vessel of Blood, Rain, Sart Battle Cars, all these and more at this rate will be lost forever. But what hurts even more are all the PS1 classics that were available. As time goes on, physical PS1 games are becoming more and more scarce and subsequently, well, more and more expensive. So many titles that deserve to be experienced by more gamers are essentially just left stranded on the PS1, but the PS3 offered an absolute ton of them digitally for a really affordable and reasonable price. This was such an awesome feature as not only could you get some iconic games from that era like Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, Final Fantasy and Castlevania to enjoy, but it also allowed you to buy and experience certain games where physical copies have absolutely skyrocketed in price. I mean, just look at games like Um Jamalami and Gex and just tell me, what would you rather do? Shell out 50 to 60 quid for a physical copy of a game that's over two decades old and may not be in the greatest condition? Or just hop on the PS3 store and buy both those games for around four quid each and if you don't like it, it's far less of a big deal. This was also the case for other games that will run you an absolute fortune to buy physically now at games like Klonoa or Tombi. Frustratingly, both of these games seem to have vanished from the PS3 store in the UK, but on July 2nd, that will be the case for all of them. 
This was such a great feature and what made it better was if you owned a PSP or Vita, a decent amount of them could also be played on both of those devices, meaning you can play a ton of great old games on the go as well. And it didn't just stop there, all models of the PS3 could play physical PS1 games, and although only certain launch PS3s could play PS2 games, the vast majority of them were given HD collection re-releases along with a real decent amount of downloadable PS2 games as well, that while sure one exactly compatible on the PSP or Vita, was still a fantastic way of playing these older games for cheap prices. Hell, even before this, if you go back a generation, the PS2, that was fully backwards compatible with PS1 games. Sony during the PS3 generation were truly one of the undisputed kings of legacy content and that for me is one of the biggest reasons why I consider the PS3 to be one of the greatest video game consoles of all time, since not only did it have an absolutely insane first party library of exclusive games and great third party games, but also a huge library of previous old games to be downloaded and enjoyed at great low prices. Which just makes it all the more baffling when you look at the PS4 and just see how much Sony has dropped the ball when it came to that system and legacy content. I'm sure some of you will immediately just think I'm going to bitch constantly about the PS4 not being able to play any previous PlayStation games natively. Which is not the case at all. I'm fully aware that the PS3 architecture is very unique and being able to put the necessary hardware for them to be able to run would be next to impossible without compromising the PS4's base performance. But what I sure as I'm going to bitch about is how when it comes to non-legacy content, the PS4 has taken a step backwards in almost every way. Firstly, PS1 classics are nowhere to be seen. Why? I will never understand why all the great PS1 games that were released on the PS3 never came to the PS4 store. I mean, are Sony seriously trying to tell me that a game made for hardware originally released in late 1994 can't be run on brand new hardware that was released practically two decades later, but it can on last gen systems and handhelds? I mean, am I the only one that finds it ironic that Sony went through all the trouble of making a PS1 themed PS4, which looks absolutely amazing, but couldn't get around to actually, you know, porting PS1 games to the console? And as for PS2 games, while well, yes, yeah, sure, Sony did put some PS2 games on the PS4 as downloadables, the amount of them compared to the PS3 is absolutely pitiful. And for what I've heard, the emulation quality on games like the Jack and Daxter trilogy is far from great. PS3 wise, to be fair, has been somewhat better. While you can't play physical games, a decent amount of PS3 games were given remasters and released on the PS4, like for example Uncharted, The Last of Us and God of War 3, and a decent amount were available to stream via PlayStation Now, a subscription service that allows you to stream a selection of PS3 and some PS4 and 2 games. But even this just feels like a half assed attempt to get these games onto newer hardware, as with PS Now you have to always be connected to the internet and there's no way to install any PS3 games and play them natively, and you have to always have a good and stable internet connection to get a good gaming experience, which a real decent amount of people don't have access to. But PS Now as a whole just feels like a big missed opportunity for Sony and just pales in comparison to Xbox Game Pass. And like, don't even get me started on the failings of the PlayStation Classic console, like Jesus Christ that was a train wreck. At least with the PlayStation 5 that system is near fully backwards compatible with PS4 games and that gives me more confidence going forward about PS4 games being preserved. But given the fact that it looks more and more likely that we won't see any more PS1 or PS2 games come to the console for the foreseeable future, just makes the closure of the PS3 store and the loss of all the PS1 classics along with it even more of a bitter pill to swallow. And sadly, when you look at one of Sony's competitors, Nintendo, they ain't doing much better in that department. Just like Sony, during the 7th generation, Nintendo were the kings of legacy content with the Wii. Not only did that system have full backwards compatibility with GameCube games natively, but a fully fledged virtual console of not just all previous Nintendo home consoles, but also the Mega Drive, Master System, TurboGrafx-16, and even arcade games. The Wii was a legacy content beast. At least if you weren't living in PAL territories like me. Sadly, Nintendo made the absolutely baffling decision to keep all games in PAL regions locked at their original but inferior 50Hz setting, instead of their correct 60Hz setting. 
I mean, the severity of this decision can vary from game to game, but I've always found it so strange that Nintendo didn't think to at least give us 50Hz the option to play at 60Hz if we wanted to, considering the 60Hz version is just far more readily available. Nowadays, you'd have to actively go out of your way to get the 50Hz version. Plus, like, have you ever tried to play Sonic 1 in 50Hz? Like, Jesus, that shit is harrowing. But you know, if you didn't live in Europe, the Wii's virtual console was absolutely stellar. The Wii U and 3DS both got the virtual console treatment later on as well, to varying degrees of success sadly. The 3DS one was fairly decent for the most part, being able to play original Game Boy games, Game Boy Color games, and even some Game Gear games at low, low prices, which was awesome, especially for games that cost an absolute mortgage to buy physically, like <clears throat> Shantae. Though the exclusion of GBA games, aside from the ones released to ambassadors in late 2011, is a decision I will never wrap my head around. As for the Wii U, it was once again fine, but boy did it have its issues. I'm glad that they for the most part gutted games running at 50Hz so us PAL guys don't have to suffer from constant slowdown, but it just didn't have the sheer quantity and variety that the original Wii one did, lacking any Sega systems or arcade games. Plus Nintendo's output was really pretty lame too. The biggest example of that has to be Nintendo 64 games. Like, it took until mid-2015 for N64 games to come to the service, but man was it not worth the wait. N64 games look awful on the Wii U due to this weird black filter they applied. Apparently it's some kind of anti-epilepsy filter, but the issue is, is that you can't turn it off, so the vast majority of us who don't have said issues have to deal with worse picture quality by default. And Nintendo 64 games really don't age that well visually to begin with, so it just ends up being super lame for most of us. Plus I know this has been probably talked about multiple times, but why were GameCube games never made available? Like, it's totally understandable why they were not made available digitally on the original Wii, because while you can use the original discs, there's no point. But the Wii U? I see absolutely no reason why GameCube games were not made available. I mean, it has the original Wii U chips and everything built into it, and that basically contains the same architecture as the GameCube. And given the discs are incompatible, this would have been the perfect opportunity to re-release them, but nope. And as for the Switch, <laughs> oh boy, this isn't good. The Switch has been out for four years, and in terms of legacy content, all we have is NES and SNES games, virus subscription service, and you can't download any games to play offline with no other consoles available. I mean, to be totally fair, the titles that have been released have been pretty good, with some of them being games that were Japanese only, or have yet to be re-released until now. But of all the consoles that are crying out for great legacy content, it's the Switch. Like, the simple fact that we still do not have N64 or GameCube games is utterly horseshit. I mean, Nintendo has clearly shown recently that both these systems are perfectly playable via the Switch in Super Mario 3D All-Stars, including the Wii, and all those games look better than ever, especially Mario 64 and Galaxy, but we still don't have them. Like, I'm sorry, but just, what's Nintendo's deal? Like, what are they waiting for? If they just put in the time and re-release some GameCube games, many of which have never been re-released, so as such physical copies are becoming extremely expensive, that's just such easy money for Nintendo. A ton of GameCube games are practically crying out to be re-released, like Mario Kart Double Dash, Smash Bros. Melee, Chibi Robo, F-Zero GX, Star Fox Assault, Kirby Air Ride, Zelda Four Swords, Doshin the Giant. Like, just take those games, up rest them up, price them on about 50 to 20 quid, and I guarantee you people would eat that shit up like crazy. I'm sorry, I got a little carried away there. Look, I love Nintendo, don't get me wrong, but just some of their recent business decisions have just been so anti-consumer. It just makes me so sad to see that a company that was once so humble about three or four years ago just become so egotistical at times. Slapping limited time releases to create artificial FOMO, drip feeding us NES games that get re-released constantly and not really releasing games people want, seemingly refusing to do much if anything about Joy-Con drift and constantly overpricing games that are not worth it at all. That's why I've personally been so impressed by the work of Microsoft when it comes to legacy content. And it's so weird because for me, it's almost like the tables have totally turned on this. 
Microsoft actually began being fairly dodgy when it came to backwards compatibility. Like the 360 was compatible with a little over half of the original Xbox's library, which is pretty impressive, but many games suffered from technical issues. Albeit most of them were fairly minor, but some were outright game breaking to the point where some games such as 007 Nightfire had to actually be removed from compatibility because you physically couldn't get past a certain point in the game. It seems fairly clear that Microsoft didn't play test a lot of them and so as such that might have been a big contributing factor to when the Xbox One launched they announced that it would have no legacy content at all. But all that changed in 2015 when Microsoft announced that the Xbox One was becoming backwards compatible with 360 games and later in 2017 original Xbox games were added too. Like so many games that are backwards compatible just look and run amazing on the Xbox One. Some even got graphical enhancement updates if you were using the Xbox One X. Added to the fact that all games are also available digitally, all online features in 360 games are supported and all DLC is being carried across as well and is available to buy, makes the backwards compatibility program Xbox has made one of the best ever. Of course the only major drawback is just like the 360, not every game is supported. Around 600 360 games are currently compatible and tragically only around 42 original Xbox games are. But basically all major exclusives on both platforms that were physically or digitally released are all compatible on the one and Xbox has made it clear that they'll be adding more from both systems in the future. As such, with the new Xbox Series X being fully backwards compatible with all Xbox One games, as well as all existing backwards compatible games from the 360 and the original Xbox with more to come later, the Series X is quite simply the ultimate all-in-one console when it comes to legacy content. I honestly have to take my hat off to Microsoft for their efforts in preserving their vast back catalogue, and if it continues to be developed with more titles added as time goes on, simply put, it could become a near on system seller as far as I'm concerned. Just the simple fact that you can buy a brand new system in 2021 that's compatible with disc games from as far back as 2001 is just insane to me. They've done such a fantastic and thorough job that, honestly speaking, if Microsoft were to announce in the next few months that the 360 store would close down, sure it'd be a real shame to see it go and a lot of people would probably be sad about it, but since they made such great efforts in preserving their games and back catalogue, I honestly think that most people would be cool with it since basically all the major 360 exclusives have made their way to both the Xbox One and Series X. It's all thanks to the backwards compatibility program that I'll probably never need to buy and own an Xbox 360 console since all the must play exclusives and big third party titles are all playable on the console I already own. Well, that certainly went on longer than I was expecting. I guess time flies when you talk about something you're passionate about. I guess some of you who watch this are probably thinking, why do you care so much about all this? If you want to play older titles that are not re-released, why don't you just emulate them? I can definitely see those arguments, but my point is that we shouldn't need to emulate stuff. Officially or unofficially, games will always be preserved in one way or another, but it's just frustrating and sad that fans seem to constantly have to do this themselves when that shouldn't be the case. I like to play games using official means, but more and more with digital stores like the PS3 store closing and certain games from older systems not being re-released, more and more people are being forced sometimes into doing just that with certain games. There are three words that will always ring true until the end of time when it comes to video game companies. Companies hate emulation. But some of them, instead of actively encouraging people to not emulate by providing great legacy content themselves, are simply giving gamers even more of a reason to do just that by not doing so themselves. And yeah, sure, I guess if I want to play the older games, another argument is why don't you just keep hold of the older systems, but... This has its problems as well since most new TVs don't have the right inputs to play a lot of these older consoles so as such I'm forced to use converters to get older systems running through HDMI plus just an all-in-one experience where possible is just far more convenient and just drains less power and means I don't have to have as much things plugged in. Sure I know a sort of solution to all of this is just buy a gaming PC but well that would be opening a whole new discussion that maybe I'll do some other time when this has already gone on long enough. I'm totally aware that backwards compatibility and legacy content isn't everything, I mean after all many of the most successful gaming consoles ever never had said feature, and there are many people who just couldn't care less about whether or not their shiny new console can play last gen games or not. 
But to me, more than ever in 2021, backwards compatibility and legacy content is more important than ever when you consider the future and preservation of gaming. And it's a feature in my eyes that honestly, to me, honestly really determines what consoles I decide I want to buy or not. Like, I could go out and buy an original GameCube, but I have a Wii which can play all GameCube games, so unless I really want the Game Boy player, there's no need to. I could go out and buy an older cartridge system like the Mega Drive or NES and SNES, but games from those consoles are re-released constantly on modern platforms, so I don't really need to. I could go out and buy a PS4 since I don't own one anymore and I want to buy it back and catch up on all the games I've missed, but why would I do that when I can simply save up and wait for the PS5 to you know, become more readily available and just use that as a way of playing all the PS4 games I've missed. It may not be the be all and end all by any means, but I generally believe that legacy content is far more important than people think, and I can only hope moving forward that Sony and Nintendo look over at what Microsoft is doing and realise that they should be doing more. We all love playing your games guys, so let's just keep it that way eh? It's a win-win for all of us.